first up is The Northman, which is directed and co-written by Robert Eggers, who is someone who I, his work just so far is not particularly for me. You know, he did The Witch, which I did not see because it seemed very scary. And then he also did The Lighthouse, which is an art house film with Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson that is truly unhinged, which I guess I could respect, but it just wasn't for me. And that's not to say that makes him a bad director. It's just, you know, my taste does not align with his. I will say The Northman is a much more commercially friendly movie than those two previous ones are. It's a it's a bigger scale and you know I'm pretty sure he got a bigger budget for it. It stars Alexander Skarsgård as a prince who's well I have spoilers but it's kind of also in the trailers whose father is murdered when he is young. We've, we've got kind of a Hamlet situation happening here. Ethan Hawke plays his father, Kleist Bang plays his uncle, Nicole Kidman plays his mom, and then he grows up into a Viking berserker and his whole life is about seeking revenge and then an opportunity maybe comes his way. Along the way he meets Anya Taylor-Joy, uh, Willem Dafoe is also briefly in this, and this is a long movie for sure. It's a two hour and 20 minute movie. We've been, there's been a lot of long movies lately, some of which I have enjoyed every moment of and some I'm like, please... Did you need every moment of this? I would say if you are a fan of Robert Eggers, there are some components of this that do remind me a little bit of some of the wilder aspects of The Lighthouse. Uh, there's a lot of gore and guts and that type of thing in this film. It's funny because I brought a friend with me to see it, and she is probably one of the most wholesome people I know. Uh, that doesn't mean she can't appreciate a film like this, but it's not what she gravitates towards. And I did find it particularly funny in that I was the one who was cringing and covering my eyes more than she was, but maybe just because I, I'm a more dramatic person. Uh, and I kept uh, almost feeling bad that I would brought her to see it, but I did send her the trailer and warn her in advance. And I will say this is one of those films where it's like, yeah, what you see is what you get from the trailer. Like, that is vibe-wise. You know, it's, it's uh, amped up in the film because you can only show so much in a trailer. But, you know, I... I thought it was fine. The film certainly got overhyped for me. I saw it when the social embargo lifted, which meant that people were allowed to talk about it on social media. People had seen it. And people were saying, oh, this is such a great film, blah, blah, blah. It's amazing. You know, it's the next great epic. And I was like, oh, okay. I guess it must be, you know, I don't, people whose film opinions I somewhat trust. But, uh, you know, th when you have that much built up about it going into it, I think it does you a disservice. So I'm going to say lower your expectations a little bit. It's a fine film. It's not a bad film. It's a little melodramatic at points. Uh, you know, if you want some eye candy, Alexander Skarsgård is the most yoked I think he's ever been. And that's more than Tarzan. He's like beefed up in this. There's a lot of weird, bad accents. Uh, looking at you, Nicole Kidman. Uh, actually looking at you too, Ethan Hawke. I don't, I don't know what's happening there. Anya Taylor-Joy is someone I'm a big fan of. She's fine in this. I think she's maybe like a little underutilized. Also, the female roles in this are a little poorly written or just like, there's a couple moments that were good, but the rest are not, it's not a film that passes the Bechdel test. We'll phrase it that way. I think the thing that I kept coming back to out of this actually was I kept thinking of the God of War game because that's a, you know, it's, I love the God of War games. I think they're a really great sort of immersive mythology thing. I love the way that they handle that stuff. And part of it's like, okay, it's a video game. You have many more hours to tell a story. You know, you are an active participant in some senses in these stories. So it's a different storytelling medium. But I did wonder, I was like, what would happen if Robert Eggers directed or creatively directed a God of War game? I could have gotten behind that. Overall, I think it's a fine film. It's not amazing. It's not going to redefine the genre. It's not, you know, I, I couldn't think of a better Viking film that I've seen, but I didn't feel like I was like, yes. This has changed how we view Viking films forever. I think it's a decent entry into that. If you're into the trailer, I think it's fine for you. If you look at the trailer and you're like, nah, I'm good, then nah, you're good. And then if you are somewhere on the fence and you're hearing all this hype about it, I would say trust your gut on it where, you know, if, if, you're, if you're feeling guts, gore, and viscera and that type of thing, like sure, go ahead. But if you're not, maybe this one is not for you. So I'm going to give The Northman three out of five. Next up, I have a film called The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, and this is a film where I had probably built up my own expectations for it, and I was the target audience for it, and boy oh boy did it deliver. So it stars Nicolas Cage as Nick, N-I-C-K, Cage. So he's playing a version of himself, you know, it's a fictionalized version of himself that feels relatively close to what I would assume the real version of himself is. And I think as a Nick Cage fan, which I consider myself, you know, 
oftentimes, especially in his later or more recent work, you ask yourself, is he in on the joke? And sometimes, I, I think actually in these last handful of years, like last three or four or five years, I say, yeah, a lot of the times he is actually now in on the joke. But there's a span of his career that's basically post-national treasure that I'm like, I don't know if he is. But at this point, unbearable weight of massive talent, it answers the question. Yes, he's now in on the joke. The premise is that Nick, N-I-C-K, Cage, you know, is, is an actor. He's having some of the same issues that actual actor Nicolas Cage has probably gone through. Things about debt, and, you know, family issues, all that stuff. And he gets an opportunity to basically appear at a party for a million dollars. Must be nice. Pedro Pascal plays a character who's just a super fan of his. And then if you watch the trailers, again, this is a week where I do recommend you watch trailers. You see that somehow he gets involved in like a, a spy operation where the U.S. government is spying on Pedro Pascal. So you've also got Tiffany Haddish, Sharon Horgan, Neil Patrick Harris, Ike Barnholtz, Lily Sheen. And, you know, I, I think I have to take a step back and like take off my super Nick Cage fan hat for a moment and say if you are not familiar with him and his filmography and sort of his cultural relevance this film will probably be very confusing I happen to be at a screening of you know film people and so there were a lot of jokes that we were laughing at that I don't know if a general audience would necessarily get that's not that's not to say that makes a general audience like ignorant but it's just like this is a niche film in some senses built for wide appeal and I do think As long as you have a general idea, you'll be fine. But it is very much enhanced by having extensive knowledge of Nicolas Cage and his filmography. There are a lot of jokes that you like, you just have to know or you have to understand where he's what he's referencing and all that sort of stuff. All that being said, I actually think it's like a relatively well made film. You know, the visual effects are kind of there. The cinematography is there. There are some strange cinematography choices. There's a lot of like really close ups of Nick Cage's face. I was like, this makes me very uncomfortable to stare at this close. You know, you just start sort of picking apart and not that, you know, everyone ages. Uh, We're not here to judge, but there are just some moments where I'm like, is your beard real? Like what's going on here? Not even to talk about like his head hair. Anyway, uh, there are some choices made, which at the end of the day, I had a delightful time. I laughed out loud multiple times. A lot of the people in my theater did. So I will say, if you are a Nick Cage super fan, if you saw this trailer and you were like, yes, this is for me, this is a hardcore five out of five. If you are not familiar, but you are open to it and you're generally aware, you know, this is a good film to watch. If you have enough of a base knowledge of sort of Hollywood and that type of joke, you'll probably get it. If you have no interest whatsoever, this is going to hardcore not be for you. But for me, I'm going to average it all out and I'm going to give it a four out of five. And then I have an animated film called The Bad Guys. And the premise is basically you've got sort of like big, bad, scary creatures, monsters. You know, you've got a wolf, you've got a snake, you've got a shark, uh, you've got a piranha, a spider who are criminals. uh, And they are committing crimes. I don't know how else to describe this film. Uh, They get caught and there's a question of like, hey, can they redeem themselves? Can they become good? Can you change your nature? I guess is the question. I oh, This is a tough one for me because I know how much work goes into an animated film. And I think we've seen many films over the years since the history of animation that show you can have a great animated film. When I see something like The Bad Guys, I get a little bummed out because I'm like, this is fine. You know, it's not great. It's not horrible. I've seen plenty of horrible animated and not animated films. But I just, I was, I was like, I, why did you make this? What story are you trying to tell here? I guess it's maybe a, a you know a meditation on can we change our nature? Are we are we you know nature or nurture? Are we born that way? Blah blah. blah. It's, but it's just it's not. <laughs> there's no complexity to this film. I think is what it comes down to. You know, it's got like a relatively talented voice cast. You've got Sam Rockwell, Zazie Beetz, Mark Marin, Aquafina, Craig Robinson, Anthony Ramos, Richard Ayawade, Alex Borstein, and Lily Singh. But there's all. It also just looked cheap. I don't. I, don't, I feel really bad saying that, but I also I just I did not personally jive with the design of it, and also they broke the rules of the world a little bit. Like some, you know, all, the shark can go on land. Okay, fine, but then most of the people in the world are humans. But then this group of bad guys essentially, you know, are animals that people can understand. And I just, you know. I just wish there had been a little more logic to it, but maybe I'm just asking too much of a film like this. And I think if we look at a film like Turning Red as a comparison, right? Like Turning Red is a film that is kid-friendly, but also has so much for adults. As an adult, without kids who didn't, you know, I don't need to entertain them. I'm not looking for a film to, you know, pass the time that way. 
I didn't get a lot out of this one. You know, I just, I, it, it felt pandery. And we've shown that you can make something that hits multiple criteria. So why don't more films get made that do that? You know, animation is filmmaking. I want to be very clear about that, which is why I hold it to the same standard. I would hold to live action, you know? So when I see something like this, I'm like, it could have been more, you know, some of it maybe have just been like a design aesthetic choice for some of the things where it's like, you know, there's a, like a hyper stylization of some things, but I just didn't like the rendering of like the, the world, like the atmospheres felt cheap to me you know and and that's not to say every film has to be a beautiful matte painting looking thing but there were just some dimensions that were missing from this from a character perspective from you know a story arc it felt very predictable at random points we break out into song which just I was like is it a musical or is it not I'm confused Craig Robinson's character as the shark was probably my favorite he I did chuckle at a couple of those things but I would say if you are an adult with younger children This is fine. You won't pull your hair out watching it. But for everyone else, this is probably going to be a pass for you. I'm going to give it 2.8 out of 5. And then finally, I want to mention a film called White Hot, The Rise and Fall of Abercrombie and Fitch. And I am someone who grew up with Abercrombie being, it sort of actually really did have a rise when I was young in my formative years. I remember the bags with the shirtless models on them. I remember, you know, the awkward dudes standing outside of the stores. I just, yeah, there's just like visceral memories of Abercrombie. And I'm proud to say I did not wear or support Abercrombie at the time, in part because I don't think I could afford it. But anyway, I, you know... I knew in the back of my mind that they were a problematic company, but this movie just reminded me or shed light on the oh so many ways that they are problematic. And so from that perspective, it was fascinating and also upsetting. But, you know, you can pick your scandal, right? You've got uh, a financial just like mismanagement probably. And then you've got the outright racism when it comes to hiring practices where they'd be like, hey, you have melanin essentially. Like you are not allowed to work the floor. It is a it's a white supremacist company in that sense. Uh, And then, you know, you've got your uh, sexual abuse scandals for some of the models. Like it's just it's where the models were abused, not saying the models are abusing people, but it's just, you know, it's just a, it's a piling on of bad. And so for those of us who did grow up with that as a, a, maybe a marker of, you know, popularity, I'm not saying it was a justified marker, but it's just, it's almost like a, a, a chef's kiss moment of being like, oh yeah, you really were terrible. And I'm glad at least, fi- you know, it's taken too long to recognize how horrible they are, but you know, your, your reputation is I don't know if there's a coming back from it. I don't even know if it had a great reputation to start, but, you know, this will just help keep as a historical reminder that, you know, you can't get away with this crap. I mean, unfortunately, you did get to get away with a lot of the crap they got away with, but uh, eventually there was some sort of comeuppance, and I hope this serves as a, as a function to to keep other companies honest. And I, I actually remember a friend of mine, her sister, who I'd also consider a friend, uh, worked at an Abercrombie, and she's one of the most beautiful people I know. Like, I hate being out in public with this family because they're all so attractive, and it's just like you, you're invisible next to them. And But they are people of color, and she is one of the people who, like, you know, they were like, work in the back, essentially. I'm like, what? What, what the hell? So uh, as someone who, like, knew people who were impacted in that way, and, like, I don't think they joined the class action lawsuit, but... Anyway, it's just, it was worth watching. It's a good watch. It's on Netflix. White Hot, The Rise and Fall of Abercrombie and Fitch.